30 seconds, stand by DDR1 to roll the open. Oh, all right. DDR1 standing by. And 15, we'll go straight from DDR1 to DDR2, the behind the scenes montage. In 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, roll the open. Welcome to HEC TV Live. Today's program, an inside look at a TV show behind the scenes of HEC TV Live. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Gore, your host for HEC TV Live, and I'm very happy to welcome you to St. Louis for today's inaugural program of our 2012-2013 school year season. We thought it was a great idea to start the season with a behind the scenes look at what it takes to put a television show together because we'll be doing these TV shows, of course, all year long. As always, HEC TV is live and interactive. We'll have a school joining us from Alvarado, Texas today via video conference. Students there who produce a television program themselves at their high school, we look forward to their questions. We know a number of folks are watching us via the web today and of course we've got our television audience as well. If you're watching on the web or on television, then please send us your email questions throughout the program to live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. We look forward to your questions. Today you're going to get the opportunity to see what it's like to put a live show together, to meet the crew that handles HECTV Live from program to program. You'll get to see the equipment that we utilize. You'll get to ask them questions about their training and any other technical questions you think would be interesting about what it means to be part of a television program, perhaps the differences between live and non-live programs, whatever crosses your mind. Those email questions can be sent to us at live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. We're in St. Louis today, actually in a pretty small room, which you're going to see in a little bit. And you're going to have the opportunity to see all the behind the scenes equipment. But as you know, most of the time, HECTV is live on location. So to begin with, we want to give everybody a chance to see some examples of those various locations from previous shows, and then we'll get started. And I'm very happy to welcome you to South St. Louis County, specifically Bussin Quarry, to welcome you to Forest Park, to welcome you to the Climate Change Exhibition here at the St. Louis Science Center. To welcome you now to the pits, the location in the America Center related next door to the Edward Jones Dome. Welcome to the Third Baptist Church here in St. Louis, Missouri. Welcome to the James S. McDonald USO headquarters right here in Lambert Airport in St. Louis. And I'm very happy to welcome you to the library at Barack Obama Elementary School here in the Normandy School District. Drummer Boy's Battle Drum, the Civil War, is actually happening at the auditorium that's here at the Missouri History Museum. And we're going to be meeting some folks related to that Civil War exhibition. One of the really cool things about HEC TV Live for me is the fact that we go to so many different places and the location varies depending upon the content of the program. We're doing a program about the science behind explosives and thus we went to Bus and Quarry so we could do an explosion. We're doing a program about a theater production at the Missouri History Museum so we'd go to the Missouri History Museum. That's what we want to do, be able to take students and general audience members live to the location where that kind of thing is actually happening that we're exploring that day. And today, of course, we're exploring what it's like to be behind the scenes of a TV show. So we're in a room here in the Dana Brown Communications Building in St. Louis, where HEC TV is housed. We're here along with Fox Sports Midwest and the Channel 9 Public Education Channel in, Kansas, in St. Louis. All of us together are in this building as uh, doing different programming all the time. We're looking forward to your questions, so forget live at hectv.org. I'm going to move off this chair for a minute because we've given you the opportunity to see a virtual set location and now this uh, screen behind me. But let's look at this room that we're in today as we walk around a little bit. And then we're going to have the chance to interact with our students from Alvarado as we begin just to look at what we've got here. So you're going to notice, first of all, we've got a couple of, of, of screens. Um, this backdrop here was the second shot. 
And then right over here, we have what forms the foundation for our green screen. And it might look a little bit unusual to folks because obviously it's not green. It's a bit more charcoal gray uh, looking. But that's because our camera actually has this ring of green lights that is operating around it. And those green lights are what enable us to create a green screen. You could do a green screen and we bring on those green lights and we switch to that camera and you can see the idea of the virtual green screen now. You bring that green screen up with utilizing those lights and because of some settings we've put into our TriCaster, which are, is our portable video studio. There's a lot of ways to do a green screen. Students at Alvarado may have questions, other email questions may come in about that. We'll look at that. Throughout the rest of the room you see lighting kits obviously set up. You see the cameras that we've got going in different places. And if we turn around and look behind us or go to our bird's eye camera view that we've got up above, you see where the crew is, the director, the tech director, the audio director, etc. We want to start by giving everybody an opportunity just to ask about the equipment that we've got set up, the type of equipment we use, and how it makes a difference in the uh, video conference operation and the live television program operation that we do. So we're going to go to Alvarado High School in Texas. Alvarado, guys, go ahead and unmute your microphone, come in, say hello to everybody in the world watching. Do you guys have a question about the kinds of equipment or what pops into your mind right now? Uh, what is the hardest part about you know, filming a live newscast? Oh, that's a great question. And, th and that's probably going to vary depending upon the person we're going to ask it of. So let's ask a number of different people as we begin to answer that question for you. Thanks, Alvarado. Um, let's start by going back here. And we'll just ask that question of our director, Jane Ballou. Hi, Jane. How are you doing? Good. So from your perspective, doing a live program, what's the most difficult thing you have to deal with? Um, you just have to be well aware of everything you're dealing with and um, just be prepared for anything that may or may not go wrong and know you just kind of have to be well organized I'd say. Okay. Colby Marshall who's sitting right next to her here is our technical director. He's running the TriCaster board, our, our video, video studio. T Colby from your perspective what makes the challenge of live production exciting? Um, just kind of being in multiple places at one time with uh, obviously the title screens like we just ran for Jane or I could I guess run for myself which I didn't haven't had the chance to do yet. Um, <laughs> being, able to <laughs> being able to do those sort of things and also run the digital video as well as just kind of keep track on what Jane is telling me as far as uh, which cameras to take and which cameras to be ready to take. So. Well, while we're here talking to you and Jane, let's talk about this piece of equipment that the students and the rest of the audience is seeing right yes. now. So tell me, this is a TriCaster? What does yeah. the TriCaster do? Yeah, this is the keyboard for our TriCaster unit. And the TriCaster is our uh, portable production studio. So it allows us to bring in um, camera sources and other video sources. For example, uh, currently you're looking at camera one. That's this camera right here that Pete's holding. Uh, we have four cameras as well as and that's camera three right there, as well as the feed coming from our Texas location there. So a um, total of five, uh, five inputs as well as all of our digital inputs coming in. So if we take Pete's camera again and bring it around and we're able to look at this screen here, yep. the students in the audience will actually be able to see all the various elements that you've got up here visually potentially ready to go. Correct. So I noticed that in terms of order, up here on the upper left is actually the camera we're showing the world? That's correct, yes. And, and this is a different shot that we could go to? Correct, yes. So we have, we have uh, camera two active. That's our second camera here, camera three uh, over in this direction. And then uh, camera four technically is not a camera. That's actually our video conference input. So that's you guys out there. And so now the world sees Alvarado High School. There correct. you go. Wave, Alvarado. Feel free to do so. There you go. <laughs> And now, and now the world uh, sees Alvarado. So you're, you're doing that, and, and Jane's basically directing you to... Correct. Jane, Jane is the one looking for the shots, and um, so she's concentrating on that, on the actual visual of the show, and I'm concentrating, I guess, on technically making that happen, thus tech director. Okay. So there you have some basics of, of the beginning of the equipment. Jane, Colby, thanks for that. Alvarado, let's go back to you guys again. Another question right now from you? Go ahead, take it away. Unmute and let us hear it. Um, is it difficult for y'all like to stay in serious, like stay serious or anything? Because I know me personally, I like to laugh, so. <laughs> I, I think that... I I think that's an absolutely great question, especially from the perspective of, of, of the guy here who gets to host the program. I think that's a really cool question. One of the, the lucky things uh, for me is I taught for 28 years before I got into this world, and so I've, I've dealt with a lot of live situations before in a classroom, whereas your teacher can tell you, and you guys probably know, almost anything in the world can happen. And that's kind of the same thing it is here with a television production. I think. 
I don't know that I'd say I find it difficult to stay serious or anything of that nature. I guess it depends on what the subject matter is. But there are those moments in time, of course, where you know that certain things are happening and you can't less, let the rest of the world know it. And you've just got to kind of keep that facial expression going that indicates you care if you're talking to the audience or you understand if you're listening to a guest or everything seems to be calm. Even though in my earpiece here, my IFB, my director might be saying something bizarre like, okay, Tim, that video is never going to run. It's never going to run. Start saying something else. Talk about something else. You can't have to balance that out yeah. in that kind of way. But I think that's one of the real cool challenges of live television is the fact that you're dealing with a real world environment. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, Think about it, if we were live at your school, for all we know, a fire alarm could go off in the middle of a program, and we would just have to react to the fact that a fire alarm is going off in the middle of a program if that was our live location. For all I know, you guys would be doing a live TV program of your own, and the fire alarm could go off. A tornado drill could happen. So those kinds of things, you guys have to go with the flow, so to speak. Great question, and don't forget, if you're joining us via television or the web, you can email us your questions to live at hectv.org. And I understand we've got some email questions, so I'm going to go pick up my cell phone so I can get those messages. But before I do that, I'm going to turn the microphone over here to Jackie Poor, who's uh, one of the producers for HEC TV Live. And Jackie, give the students an idea about what it's like to be a producer. What are the kinds of things that a producer does? The biggest thing is research and a lot of preparation. A lot of these shows may take several weeks or a couple months just to get them together before we get to this point. Want me to hold that? Go right ahead. Okay. And then it's putting a format together and the whole rundown on the show, I can show you this. Pete, can you get a, hold, get a shot of that? Okay. And we just put all the elements together. When we're going to be live, when we're going to go into a tape roll-in, and uh, when we're going to be taking questions from the students. And you mentioned earlier some funny moments. Our technical director, in case you don't know it, he has a lot of impressions. And he keeps us laughing all the time. So um, we have to keep it together even when he makes us laugh. Right, Colby? Oh, I don't know about that. Well, Colby, maybe we'll take the opportunity to have you actually give us some of those impressions <laughs> later. Um, We've had a great email question come in actually for the students in Alvarado, Texas. And I was going to ask you guys this, but let's go for it right now. The, the, the viewer would like to know what's the kind of news program you guys do at Alvarado? What's the kind of TV guy show that you guys are producing? Who'd like to speak to that? Uh, we don't have a live show. Uh, we kind of put together different uh, bits and uh, I guess general announcements, news and stuff like that from our football games and things. And we compile them into a show that, you know, would be watched like a news show, uh, but isn't necessarily the uh, live cast that you would have. Very cool. And is that done on a weekly basis? Do you guys put it together weekly? And how long does the program last when it airs? I think our show is going to be somewhere like nine minutes long. And uh, we're planning on doing it every two weeks once we get started. Very. Uh, last year, I mean, we had it almost every two weeks. And, uh, but it's just, it depends on how long it takes to put it together. Do you guys find it easy or difficult to fill nine minutes of time? <laughs> <laughs> very, <laughs> <easy>. <laughs> it's very, very, very easy. That's great. You've got so much content, you can fill nine minutes. And nine minutes goes by really, really fast. I'm kind of amazed about that sometimes in our live television show environments that, you know, the show just gets started and you're running and the next thing I know, the producer is saying into my ears, okay, we're 20 minutes in or we're 40 minutes in and time just flies by. And we've obviously got a format together where we think certain things are going to happen at certain times. But since we're live and interactive, especially with like student audiences like you guys and we're getting email questions, there's no guarantee we're going to necessarily be able to make that uh, format hit at the exact same time we want it to. So that kind of adjustment is always part of what we're dealing with. Let's talk a little bit more about equipment. Um, I'm going to go over here to Chris Martinez. Hi, Chris. Hi, Tim. Chris is our audio engineer for the program. And Chris, uh, introduce yourself to the students, give them an idea about what it is you do as the audio man here. Yes, my name is Chris Martinez and I uh, run the audio for the live show. And what we basically do is we coordinate many inputs into the board and mix them for broadcast or for the room, whatever, whatever venue we happen to be uh, taping in. So uh, currently we're running audio to the speaker. So when the students speak, we can map it to that speaker and back into the program both. Uh, this audio board, as you notice, has many channels. Each one of these are separate channels that your microphone goes into or the polycom, the device that the students speak into, um, or the TriCaster B-roll. And what we do is we are able to uh, monitor that audio and control it on the board. So during a live show, we have to constantly monitor it and adjust for 
variations in audio. If I move away from the microphone, I have to bring it up a little bit so you can hear me. Or if I get too close, I have to lower it so that it's not as loud. Um, so it just basically means paying attention to the audio as it happens and adjust accordingly. And I notice as the audio happens, we actually see it if we can get a close-up of yes. here. The little lights go up and down. Those are called meters. Those are meters. Thank you. I thought it was a technical term, the little lights going up and down. Thank you, Chris, for that. So if I talk louder like that, you've got to, be, you've got to quickly realize what I'm doing and adjust. Yes. That's why you like working with me so well, right, Chris? Yes. Because I would never shout at you. <laughs> never. Uh, like that. Thank you, Chris. Feel free to give the, the students that positive impression as we go. Um, so you're constantly, because you're having to deal with the fact that I may have one volume of voice and Jane is the director who's on with us today, seems to have a quieter voice and Colby has a different voice and then you've got to bring the students in. So those lights are really key and following those lights really is all that matters to you. That is correct. We have a level that we call our line level and it lets us know what the peak audio level is or what we, what we can't go above. So we cannot go above zero. So I have to watch the meters here and on the screen, and that's where you'll see me looking mostly, to look at the audio meters on the screen because that's our broadcast level. That's what's going out to the audience. Very cool. Alvarado, let's go back to you guys. An audio question or another question of any type? Go for it. You know, I'm sure you guys have gone through lots and lots of broadcasting, and I'm sure you make mistakes. So uh, can you name any of your funnier mistakes that you can recall? Well, first of all, I just want you to know that I'm shocked, shocked that you would think any mistakes could ever happen in a live television production. Um, well, let's begin with what mistakes have we made already today? Um, I don't know, but some of our funnier mistakes. Who wants to think of one? Gosh. I keep getting a camera shot. I keep getting a camera shot. Oh, well, okay, so there's one thing. Well, one of the things that I kind of find interesting constantly, and you guys are going to notice this throughout the course of the program, is that obviously I'm talking to all these different people and we've got three different cameras running, but I don't necessarily know at the moment in time which camera, like when I turn and decide to talk to you guys, which camera I'm going to talk to. So, um, you know, that's getting fed into my ear from, my, from the director and sometimes they're pointing to me, but sometimes if I'm talking to you or I'm talking to a guest, then my ear decides it doesn't want to hear very well, and so I'll be talking into this camera, and for all I know, they're actually showing me from my right profile side at this moment in time. I'd have to look and see. That's happened on more than one occasion that I can remember. Jackie's now going to share a memory that I'm sure will be something fun. Yes, on Veterans Day last year, one of our veterans took off with a microphone. And what they don't realize, we can hear everything that's going on with that microphone that's going wherever they're going. So it's, it was pretty funny. We yes. had to track it down, the, the microphone. It took us a while to get it. And, and Helen Hedrick, our utilization coordinator who handles all the email questions, has her hand raised. And Helen, I'm going to bring you out into the light so the world can see you. We'll actually come over here and just, just stand, here. stand right here, Helen. Okay. So uh, you've got a story to share with the kids? Yes, yeah, several years ago we were coming live from uh, Forest Park, the uh, big ah. park in St. Louis, and there was a union issue and we had a union representative charge into our set. And that was kind of a surprise. Yeah, I remember that one now. And of course, obviously, obviously if we're uh, outside then we have to deal with weather conditions. I've personally been involved in a program before where all of a sudden the big hailstorm came up and uh, we had a tent. Uh, that was covering up all the equipment, but the hailstorm and the wind came up and it blew the roof off the tent. And so through the course of the program, um, Tim's bald head was being attacked by hail. Um, I don't know if I'd call it funny, but it was certainly exciting. Uh, that's for sure. Alvarado, we want to give you an idea of how long it takes to set up all this equipment and let the world know that as well. So we've got a time-lapse video from a different program last spring, actually, when we did behind the scenes of HEC TV Live in this same room uh, last spring. And it'll give you an idea of all the stuff that has to go into the room, and obviously a little faster since we're going to speed it up for you. Let's run that now. So it's a bare empty room here at the Dana Brown Communications Building to start with, but it's going to be filled up pretty quickly with all sorts of equipment. You notice that we've got some signage that'll come in eventually to identify, but a couple of tables have to go in. Our footprint's actually not very big at all. Uh, we can fit everything into a couple of tables, so when we go live on location, that means we don't have to take up a lot of a space or anything of that nature. Um, but the tables get set up, the video screens go up, the, the TriCaster is going to come out of that box and uh, enable itself to do its thing. You'll notice that last spring our green screen was actually green. Um, this year we've got a different green screen operating, and as I mentioned, we're using that ring of green lights to create the green screen. And then you begin to see the light kits go up. Um, depending upon where we are for the show, how big the room is, do we want more than one location for Tim to talk to guests to, or we're going to have a demonstration somewhere, that kind of thing, then obviously that dictates how many lights have to go up um, for everything. 
and the green screen itself dictates a certain type of lighting to make sure that it operates pretty effectively because you've got to be able to separate the person from the screen and all those kinds of things. A different backdrop um, screen you're going up that you're seeing there, different than the one we've got this year. And then the crew's just working fast and furiously to get everything else together. So by that time you've seen a, a camera, a couple of cameras go up, more light kits moving around, and obviously all of this is being filmed from the camera we're giving you a bird's eye view from, and that's basically the same camera setup we've got going today for the bird's eye view pictures as, as, as well. But depending upon the location, it probably takes us anywhere from 60 to 100 minutes to set up. Um, and that just depends on the, the location, uh, the amount of cabling that we're going to have to deal with, the uniqueness of the particular location, all of those kinds of things. But by the time that 90 to 100 minutes are up, then we're good to go and we're back live just like we are now. And actually, I believe I'm talking to the right camera. Is that correct, Jane? Yes. Jane's saying yes to me, so that's a good thing. Alvarado, another question from you guys. Um, do you need any like specific training or anything like that in order to be what you are and go live and stuff? That's a great question. I'll give you a chance to, in, to meet basically everybody in our crew. I'll have a variety of different people talk to that. So Jane, let's start with you from the director perspective. Your training, how did you get going? Um, I started about five years ago as a video editor. And HEC is a great place to work if you want to learn new skills. So I've done TDing, I've done camera, and then last year I started doing directing. So it's kind of been on-the-job training for you. Yeah. So Chris, from an audio engineer's perspective, university training, on the job, a combination, what? Some university training and um, private study uh, with recording studios. Okay, very and, and on the job. On the job as well. And then Jackie, I know from your end as a producer, you went to journalism school? Yes, I did get a degree in, in television production. And I also started out as main stage big productions, and that transferred into uh, television production. Very good. So you got a whole wide variety of things there. And our technical director, Colby Marshall, we can't let him out of this moment. Colby, how'd you drop into this? Um, I actually worked for a... Try not to swallow the microphone there. I tried to... I actually started working for a company that uh, made a competitor product to the TriCaster and um, did a lot of on-the-job training there, doing training actually for people who bought the systems. So between that and um, doing some just outside kind of hobby DVD production work, um, this happened. Very cool. And would this be an appropriate time to share with the students your alter ego life nah, before no, the world of HGCTV? No, TV? no, no, it wasn't. No, okay, well, no. kids, you may want to ask about that later because we don't want to get away without Colby being able to share a little bit of his previous life as well. That's a great question, Alvarado. And so, you guys, let's go for another one from you. And I'll check my phone to see if we've got some email questions. Take it away, Alvarado. Do y'all have any, like, problems with time management? I guess the short answer to that is yes. Um, I think one of the really fascinating things about doing a live show, especially the kind of live show this is, is that it's really very fluid in terms of time. We've got 60 minutes. But to me, from, I approach it very much like a classroom experience, obviously, since I taught for all those 28 years. And you've got like 50 minutes in a classroom or 55 minutes in a classroom. And ideally speaking, you know that you want to accomplish X by the end of the hour. And you line some things up during the course of that period to hopefully get to X. And if life is good, which happens every once in a while, as your teacher can probably tell you, you get to X following the steps just the way you wanted to. But most of the time, it just can't happen. Um, because kids have questions, uh, the DVR doesn't work, um, you know, some sort of technical issue happens, or whatever the case may be, or you just end up talking about some subject longer than you were before. It just ends up taking longer to do a certain activity than you thought it would. So that's really, really an important thing to think about in terms of time. Jackie, from a producer perspective, something you'd like to share about the time question? Yeah, I think sometimes early morning, it, it, it takes us a little longer to get going, depending on the venue, because some venues we get there, and we have to move a ton of furniture just to set it up before we can even get going. So time can get away from us sometimes like that. But yeah, it takes a lot of time management on every, every aspect of the positions. And Chris, we've got an email question that asks about audio delays. Um, is there, do we have any kind of audio delay in terms of like dealing with people's language perhaps or something coming through the system we don't want the world to hear? We do not. We do not operate on a, on a delay. Um, there's a natural delay, of course, but we don't utilize that for sensor reasons or anything like that. I just sensor. If we need to, we do it immediately on the board. Very good. Cool. <laughs> we want to give you guys a chance to uh, see what it's like to actually call the show at certain moments in time and bring up different video. And so 
Jane and Colby are going to work here for a moment as we bring up a piece of video that deals with cabling. You guys may have noticed a whole bunch of cables coming out of the audio equipment from behind the, the, the desk here. Uh, definitely you see tons of cable coming out of the video screens and into the video conference box and then cable ring run to the camera. And the, the video you're going to see is a, is a cable run for a show we did last spring. Depending upon, of course, the location, then there's a heck of a lot more cable to deal with than there would be on, you know, another location. Um, but Jane, I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys to start so the kids can see what it's like, hear what it's like, and see what it's like as you begin to call for a certain thing, and then we move from me and we actually run that. Okay, so right now we are on camera two, camera three, and so we're going to cut to camera one for an artsy shot from Pete. So I'm going to say stand by so Pete knows that he, it's his turn and he'll be ready to go. So I'll say stand by camera one, take camera one. We say take and then he knows he's up. And then we're going to go to our cable running video. So I'll stay stand by cable running video on DDR2 and take the video. And now we're in the video. And what you see here is actually we use a satellite truck, a microwave truck from K KSDK Channel 5 in St. Louis to help us get the microwave signal back to the TV station for the TV broadcast. And then the cable run you're seeing here is actually at that venue from outside the building through doors of the school all the way up the all the way up the stairs and all that good stuff into the library where we were doing it at Oakville High School at that moment in time until eventually it got up to the camera and just like today the cable is connected to a camera. So depending upon where we're located that cable run could be pretty short like today's relatively short but we're going to be at the Thomas F. Eagleton Federal Courthouse in a couple of weeks on September 17th we're going to have a lot longer cable run. Obviously when we're outside as we've done at various places like the Bus and Quarry Science Pond Explosions program then there was a lot of cable run outside as well so it just varies from location to location thanks everybody who's sending in your email questions don't forget that email address is live at hectv.org let's go back to alvarado texas another question from you in texas um let's say you're new to this field and you're not reading from a teleprompter what happens when you forget and freeze up great question and I don't do any reading from a teleprompter. We don't use any kind of teleprompter at all for HEC TV Live. And in fact, interestingly enough, I've never done a tele used a teleprompter with any television program I've done. And I think that's probably to a large extent just to the nature of this show. Um, it's interactive, it's designed to get you know, kids involved in whatever we're doing, it's designed to get the audience involved in whatever we're doing. I could be in any number of places in the room depending upon what questions you ask me. So having a teleprompter would be kind of difficult for us because it has to be attached to a very specific camera. If, of course, I'm doing like a television news broadcast and I've written that script and I want to make sure I'm telling the news factually and accurately, then the teleprompter becomes extremely important because you want to make sure you get out the story exactly the way you wrote it. Uh, I think that's a real challenge and I think it's kind of intriguing in terms of how teleprompters operate. Jackie? A tip for most reporters, instead of writing your entire script down, is to go ahead and put keywords and that'll trigger a memory. You can practice it before then, but as long as you have your keywords, that'll get you right back on track. Very, very good suggestion. Alvarado, let's go back to you immediately. Another question from you. Uh, I had a question about, you know, camera preference. Is there any, uh, not to turn it into a ad or commercial or anything like that, but do you have a certain preference for camera equipment? Very cool question. I'm going to actually come out to the center here and, and we'll talk to one of our camera operators and we talk about equipment, the cameras that we're using, then we can ask for some examples of that. Um, so, so Pete Foggy, thanks very much for being with us today. Yes. So Pete, first of all, we're going to get to his question about recommendations on camera equipment, but show the kids what you're working here with this handheld camera. What does it do and how do you operate it? Well, we're using a Panasonic um, 170 and um, it's like a handheld camera. Um, it's not as big as our 500, which is the main camera over there. And um, it, it, it's okay, you know, it does the job, but if you want like shallow depth of field, or look like film, sometimes you want the, something with a bigger sensor. This is a smaller sensor camera. It's good for what we need, but if you want to do some RC stuff, then you know, need something with a bigger sensor. Okay, let's look at that bigger sensor, because the 500 camera is what you're pointing to over here that right. Rick happens to be on. So if we take a shot from the 500 camera now versus your camera, let's look at those, so those two shots. So I'm shooting a bigger camera right here. That's more like a broadcast camera, and I have like more like a pro-zoom camera. You know, you can shoot with any camera. You know, you know, know your camera very well, know where all the buttons do, and know how to light, then of course, you know, you have a, you know, you can do anything with any camera. And you've been doing it for quite a long time. To go to the student's question about preferences, are there certain cameras you like better? Um, 
I used to like the bigger cameras better because, you know, if you put it on your shoulder, you know, and like when you use one of these cameras, you, you know, your hands always, you, you take one of your hands away because you're busy holding it. But one of those big cameras would be on my shoulder and I can use my hands to do different things. So that's the, that's, that's the only reason I like the bigger camera better. And are, there's a whole variety of camera equipment manufacturers, obviously. Right. Let's give some uh, examples for, for the yeah. audience. Well, like there's Sony, uh, Panasonic, JVC for cameras. Then they got the new Black Magic Cinema, which our man Rick loves. <laughs> <laughs> that haven't, haven't come out yet. Technology changes every month, so it's, you always have to keep abreast of what's out. You know, like you know, in the old days, how we used to use tape. Now I'm going to use a P2 card, which is like solid state memory. You know, so it makes transferring the um, footage real quick. Very, you can do that very quickly. You know, I can't even sit through tape anymore, you know, so. <laughs> so. Now, how did you get involved in the camera world? Um, I started as an intern, you know, learning the business, reading the books, and watching TV. That's how I learned a lot, is watching TV. And you just have to, you have to go out there and develop your eye. You know, like sometimes, you know, you may put four people in a room, you tell them to shoot the same thing, and somebody may shoot something different, so. You know, you're just developing your eye and see how other people do things, too, on TV. Very cool. Let's go back to Alvarado for another question. Go ahead, Texas. I'm sure you guys have to deal with technical difficulties on the fly, you know, on, on a daily basis, and you have to deal with them on the fly. So what, what would you say is your most common technical difficulties, and how do you deal with those situations on the fly? Oh, that's a great question. Most common technical difficulties. Well, I think I'll just speak from my perspective, and it may just be the nature of what our show is, I think there's two common technical difficulties. And one is the unique thing that we have with video conference connections, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And the second one for me, I think it's just the nature of the audio continually. And that's not because um, our audio people aren't doing their job effectively, they're, they're amazingly good. But what I just think I notice that a lot because I'm hearing things in my ear and all that good stuff.